Now, uh, Dr. Slater, in his wonderful presentation, um, touched on the fact that it's kind of expensive to do this. And so one of the things we wanted to really focus on is the process of funding clinical trials. So I'm going to ask each of our panelists to just give a short um, introduction of who they are and also where they fit in the process and also the importance of the work that they're doing at their different organizations. And each of them brings a different perspective. And Dr. Scheffner, would you kick us off? Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Jeremy Scheffner. I'm uh, Chair of Neurology and Associate Director at the Barrow Neurological Institute. And so my, where, where I come from is an academic model. Um, at the Barrow, we're very focused on clinical care, but we also have a, a very strong focus in clinical and translational research. Uh, we have a basic neurobiology department that is actively uh, looking for ways to bring their discoveries to clinical trials and we're increasingly focused on trials that are sponsored by outside agencies, but also to begin trials in, 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 that, are, that are focused at, at Barrow and, and where we're the leaders. In my own research life, I've been focused on a disease called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or Lou Gehrig's disease for about 30 years. Um, I started a, a, an academic clinical trials consortium for the exact reason that was just mentioned, to try to improve the efficiency of clinical trials in ALS where there really isn't any uh, adequate mo disease-modifying therapy. And so we have been very active in both phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials, um, tr trying in every way we can to uh, improve the efficiency of what we do. So whatever expertise I have is not in the funds generating component, but in trying to improve the efficiency of trials. Um, what was said about biomarkers is going to be critical for, I think, for all of us. Um, but that's where, that's where my, my interests lie. Perfect. Thank you. And so, Teresa, you're coming at it from a different perspective. Now, we're all about the funding. I'm Teresa Bartels with Gateway for Cancer Research. We have a vision of a world in which a cancer diagnosis is no longer feared. And the way that we go about that is by funding phase one and two clinical trials. Wherever we can find them in the world, we're looking for the most meaningful, innovative, breakthrough kinds of research that's happening with real patients. And our focus is very much on what happens to those patients who are enrolled in the trials as much as what happens to the contribution that those clinical trials make to treatment options uh, for the future. We really um, want to find ways to speed up the process. As Mark said, these people who are suffering don't have the time to wait. And so part of our focus when we fund a clinical trial is to um, make sure that they can complete the accrual within a couple of years so that we're funding that valley of death transition from the lab to getting it to the bedside and moving it through those early trials faster. We have 36 different trials that we're currently funding. I would love to have some that are in Arizona, so I'm hoping that there are some researchers here today that would love to talk about that, as well as opportunities for people to contribute, because that's really what um, our focus is. There's a lack of government funding, especially in phase one and two, and there's great opportunity for people, individual people, to get involved and help make those clinical trials happen. And Terry? Uh, Terry Urbine, uh, economist from the University of Arizona College of Pharmacy. Uh, so we talk a lot about efficacy uh, here, about drugs and about treatments and interventions, but uh, something that comes up sometimes in conversation, especially in oncology, is the, uh, the financial toxicity of medications. 
And so we're always looking at the Hope Center at Arizona, at the University of Arizona, for opportunities to assess the effectiveness in terms of cost. But it's difficult at times to compare treatments uh, for different diseases that have different costs and different effectiveness. So much like some of the national health organizations in other countries, we like to assess treatments across the board to determine whether they are cost effective in a land of limited resources. So that's where the profession of economics is able to bring to bear some science of sorts uh, to assess whether or not certain medications are pursuable or should be funded. And this has been an area of controversy uh, right here in the Valley that, that needs more attention, I think. Uh, for example, proton beam therapy, uh, while it, it promises a different method of, uh, of cure uh, for radiation treatments, it's yet to be shown whether or not the number of years that are purchased with that uh, are, are the same value as some other form of treatment, uh, which is not being funded. So uh, we do need to push all frontiers forward at once, but we can't explore all the planets at once with our health spending. We're now a $3 trillion health economy. Uh, 300 billion of that is uh, prescription medications. So that is uh, a resource that's not unlimited, uh, but it's very large. And the prudent application of that is uh, where an economist comes into play. And uh, my uh, position at the university is an associate research scientist in health economics, and we hope to add a little bit of uh, support to the uh, appropriate areas of pursuit for uh, interventions, uh, but rationalizing that in a way that's uh, somewhat controversial, but it needs to be done at some point. So, you know, Teresa, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about is money. And the costs of trials have doubled in less than 15 years. And quite frankly, federal funding is declining. Um, how can organizations like yours you know, connect with and work with both contributors as well as innovators to try and fill that gap? I think that it's an opportunity for the philanthropic community to um, be on the front edge, especially with those early trials. Um, that's, that's what we focus on. We can be uh, probably more um, risky in some of the kinds of uh, trials that we'll fund. Um, for example, right now we're, we're funding a uh, first in children trial with tumor paint at Seattle Children's Hospital. Some of you may have heard of it. It's been efficacious in animals and in adults. This is a way of lighting up the tumor cells in brain cancer. And especially with children, you want to be incredibly precise in surgery, removing those tumors. And a lot of times, surgeons can't tell the difference between normal tissue and cancer cells. So this particular trial, um, it, the substance, the compound that was created, comes from the venom of a scorpion. And injected into the patient creates a fluorescence of the, the cancer cells. If this is successful, which we expect it will be, it will change the way that surgery, especially brain surgery, is done. The researchers told us that the biggest challenge that they had was getting funding for the trial because they were told it was too innovative. So I think it's an opportunity for those of us in, in the nonprofit world to mobilize people who think these are important trials and get them funded. Now, yeah, Jeremy, the um, work that's being done right now with phase zero trials um, is another area where we truly are having opportunities to do things in new ways. Do you want to kind of share how that helps? Sure. I, I do want to say as a, as a bit of a caution that phase zero trials, which I'll describe in a second, are 
probably most applicable to oncology trials, and their, their, at least their application so far has been to that. And um, that, that and, and I'd also like to say that, that, that oncology as a field is probably the most advanced in, in the clinical research spectrum. And so, so most of neurology, cardiovascular health, we struggle with things that in, in many ways have been successfully dealt with in the oncology world. Um, but the, the phase of development, phases of developments were described by, by Mark earlier. Um, although the, the boundaries are being merged, phase one to three, phase two to phase three is a pathway of safety trials to potential proof of concept trials to true efficacy trials. And they're very, very costly. And the barrier to getting to phase one is high because in many ways, appropriately, the FDA and, and European regulators as well have, have really wanted to see a very significant package of preclinical toxicology before you give drugs at any dose and in any way to, to humans. Uh, the idea behind phase zero is that with somewhat less animal work, you can determine a, a, a level which is called the no, no observed adverse effect level, which is the, the highest amount that doesn't produce any adverse effect in an animal. And if you can show that and then go way down, divide that by 100 or divide that potentially by 50, you can be pretty sure that that dose in humans will not be toxic also probably won't be effective, but it, it, won't, it won't be toxic. And, and to the extent that we now are very sensitive at measuring concentrations at drug levels, you can give single or very few doses of that very small amount of drug, map where it goes in the body, find if it goes in oncology potentially to the tumor, and then I think the critical aspect of this is the development of biomarkers because getting to where you want it to go is really only maybe a tenth of the battle. It has to do what you want it to do. And with very sensitive ways of measuring whether the drug gets to its target, has the intended effect on the target, you can, you can determine whether this drug is worth going forward or not. Now, that is not the same thing as saying that the drug is going to work, but it's a really useful first step. And I think in many ways, the prime use of this kind of, of, of phase zero uh, uh, design is to eliminate drugs that don't get that far. And so um, we talked about how you need maybe 250,000 drugs to get to one, one, uh, one usable drug. Well, uh, you want to get rid of as many of those as possible. And this is a relatively inexpensive, fast way to do that. And then a lot, it, so it doesn't substitute for these other phases, but it potentially winnows your, 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 your group of potentially active compounds in a very effective way. Thank you. And uh, in, as we're talking about funding, I guess I can't not ask an ALS specialist, okay, did you take the ice bucket challenge? I'm on YouTube. <laughs> and, 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 and I mean, I think the ice bucket challenge, which probably even people who have never heard of ALS have heard of this, is, is an amazing example of how uh, a grassroots movement can really push a field forward because uh, it raised about $113 million for ALS research, which was a factor of 10 more than, than was available from non-NIH non sources. And there's just a host of activity that would not have been possible without that. See, so there is value to Twitter after all. <laughs> so, you know, as we look at this from an economic perspective, Terry, there's a lot of talk about the escalating price of certain innovator drugs. And there's a lot of pushback in the community, even though in reality, there's a lot of expense that goes into developing those innovator drugs. How do we find a balance? Uh, well, there are many creative ideas out there, but ideas are free. And so I, I once read that an economist is a, a man that knows a lot about money, but doesn't have any. So uh, some of these ideas, uh, which I'll table for now, uh, but uh, the, identi the identification of that threshold of the billion dollar development, the 15 uh, year development process, uh, there may be some regulatory reform possible, and I think you're going to broach on that in a moment, uh, having to do with the regulation and approval of drugs uh, uh, for use uh, on patients uh, 
uh, indicated drugs. And that 15 year time period in that thousands of patients uh, that need to be recruited is one of the, the cost components that have been identified. For one, your Jerry doesn't have that much time. You kind of showed us to him as he was dangling over the edge of the well mark and uh, there wasn't enough time for a 15 year drug to be approved uh, for him individually. But for the healthcare system overall, the cost aspect is, uh, is a problem because you do need to have that full patent period to recover the billion dollars uh, and you need that price. You need that $70,000 course of treatment cost in order to recover the billion dollars and that's for the one that got approved. So uh, some of these uh, things like uh, phase zero uh, are identified to uh, winnow out candidates that won't uh, make it and so you don't waste those resources. Uh, don't want to use the term waste but you don't squander those limited resources to get the billion dollar drug approved. Now, we, we can't help but think about hepatitis C and the current controversy over pricing for that drug, which uh, Sovaldi, which is the, uh, the brand name, which uh, is used to treat very effectively a new type of target uh, mechanism, and it's 100% effective for the right strain of hepatitis C, but it's very expensive. Uh, but they do need to recover that money. But if you compare that, to an alternative cost, which would be uh, liver transplant, uh, ultimately, uh, and cirrhosis and death. The, uh, the cost to the individual is very high for those consequences, but for a health system as well. Transplants are quite expensive and they have limited effectiveness. So what we do in health economics is try to look down the road at what those costs might be that you could avoid and provide justification for both the price once approval is achieved, as well as investment. So when you're looking at investors, they don't have time to wait either. You can't decide five years from now if the Apple Watch was a great success and then buy Apple stock. You sort of need a prognostication of whether or not it's going to be. And one of the things that we've done for some of the smaller uh, uh, biotechnology companies, one of which I think is represented here, VisionGate, is we've provided in indication of how much their technology can save to a health system in terms of avoided costs due to, for example, false positive identification of lung cancer. A false positive identification costs a lot of money uh, because there are other procedures that take place that you could avoid if you didn't have a false positive indication. So with that simulation of the future, we're able to provide investors with some reassurance that uh, taking uh, this device through a form of clinical trials uh, is justifiable because once you get it approved, it will, uh, it will save money for the health system that invests in it. Another example is robotic IV preparation. Uh, there's a lot of controversy in, uh, well, a lot of news about infections that were caused by uh, compounded medications that were prepared in the New England pharmacy that uh, caused people to have uh, infections of the, uh, the uh, central nervous system due to the injections that were prepared incorrectly uh, and were uh, contaminated. So there's an interest in hospitals to prepare injectables and IV preparations robotically in a sealed uh, compartment, but this costs a million dollars. Well, who's gonna pay for that? Not all hospitals can afford that, so you need to sort of simulate which ones are probably gonna save money from that. So investors, may benefit from the information that is a forecast of what's going to happen, and that will attract money into funding uh, these early trials. That's one of the strategies. Teresa? It occurs to me that um, genomic profiling is one way that you might see some decrease. Um, we're funding one trial that is at Yale University, Dr. LaRusso, who's in partnership with TGen. And she's looking at a particular mutation, the BRAF wild type in metastatic melanoma. And using genomic profiling, they will test up to 20 different agents, possibly saving those patients from going through treatments that were not going to help them at all. So at least saving some, some funding that way. The other way that I think um, we look at it is a lot of our research that we're funding is repurposing of drugs that have already been developed. So taking, and I never can say this word, ipilimumab, 
which is standard of care um, in some cancers. Um, a doctor at Stanford is now injecting it intratumorally instead of systemically. So trying different ways of using drugs that have already been developed, I think, can also help us to keep the costs um, at least within reason. Uh, I, I mean, I can think of at least one drug that was developed for cardiac issues <laughs> that's found a very successful other application. You think? You think? Yeah. So, uh, maybe I could pop in just a little bit and add a, an extra level of complexity. Um, and that is that we're going to have to come to grips with very soon the idea of how to develop drugs to treat at-risk communities that don't have the disease at the moment. And uh, the obvious one in neurology is Alzheimer's disease, where by the time somebody is diagnosed, the disease has basically ravaged the central nervous system. And the way we're going to effectively treat this ultimately has to be treating the patient before they actually show symptoms. But in order to do that, then you have to think about, if you're looking at clinical outcomes, trials that are going to last decades. Um, and so things that, that were just mentioned, such as genomics, identifying people who genetically are at specific levels of risks, and then hopefully targeting therapies to that genetic uh, risk factor are going to be crucial. But the, many of the diseases that, 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 that we ultimately treat as physicians are going to only be effectively treated if we treat them before symptoms present. And, and that's a huge both financial and scientific challenge. I think um, you know, what we've seen here in Arizona, and a good example is the work that Dr. Ryman and his team are doing right now that's being funded by the NIH in partnership with industry. Correct. And, and um, so Dr. Ryman is, 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 for those of you who don't know, is, is a psychiatrist who's been focused on Alzheimer's disease for many years and has been looking primarily at imaging markers, but has correlated that to genomics in a very effective way. And I think just as importantly, has been able to really fashion together consortia that, 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 that take advantage of federal funds and industry funds and, and advocacy funds in a way that's really pushed things forward. I've seen numbers like $100 million plus is going, cycling through that one program in Medellin. Well, that's what I hear. That's what I hear, yes. So philanthropy plays such a huge role in this. And I think on both sides of the spectrum, you know, the work that you're doing, um, Teresa, and then Jeremy, the support that the community has provided to the Barrow for over 50 years. You know, I'd love to kind of hear both of your perspectives on, you know, if you were going to talk to a donor on the tremendous impact that they can make, what would you tell them? Oh my goodness, there's so many things to talk about when it comes to cancer research. I think there are 7,000 organizations that are raising money to support different um, patient kinds of, of activities. I think people don't realize that even small contributions, when collectively um, focused, can make a huge difference. So we talk with individual um, people on our website about fund one day. $20.75 will help us to get those trials funded. If somebody is more generous, we're going to talk about funding a trial or different ways that they can um, get engaged. I think also patients and patient advocacy groups can make a big difference in helping us to determine the priorities. As Mark said, it's really all about the patient. And sometimes research can be research for the sake of the academic pursuit. With limited funds, we want to make sure that it's benefiting the patients now, as well as in the future. And Jeremy, when we look at the work that's being done at the Barrow, and we've had some very high profile philanthropists get involved with the Barrow, but most of the donations come from people just like you and me, right? 
Oh, definitely. And I'm speaking as a, as a newcomer to the Valley, so I've only been here since October. But it's clear that, that, that the, the Barrow is, is, is a success in, in large part because of, of its ability to energize the, 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 the motivations of its patients. And, and so um, I think there really are, 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 are almost two distinct ways that, that, that we have to think about uh, philanthropy. One is not so much dedicated to places like the Barrow, but something like the ALS Association's I expect a challenge, where vast numbers of people can feel good about donating money to a cause that's fairly general. It's not to a specific trial. It's not to uh, a specific biomarker project. It's it's in the belief that th these dollars will be will be um, spent well, and that 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 the disease will be treated better in the future. And, and I think that works very well for smaller donations. Uh, at least in my experience, when there's somebody with significant resources, um, they want to be a little bit more specific. And um, I actually tend to argue that, at least in neurology, investing in a trial is a high risk, potentially low reward effort. because. So my, my career statistics are appalling. I've, I've been, been a leader or a participant in about 45 ALS trials, and I'm 0 for 45. So trying to tell somebody that the next trial is where they should put their money is, is not necessarily a compelling case. But what I can say is that look at all this incredible knowledge that is going to lead us to better success in the future, and you should invest in people. Um, you should invest in bringing a world-famous uh, scientist who does specific something in, 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 in ALS or somebody who is uh, uh, dealing with genetic treatments of Alzheimer's or, or you know, the, where the money will go towards a continuing effort, not just a specific event which will, will succeed or fail. And so I, I think that, that that is relevant to the Valley in general, that what we should be interested in is bringing in expertise and bringing in uh, people who will, will help us lead efforts in a variety of, uh, of diseases in the future. Thank you. And, you know, as we wrap things up, and we'll go ladies first and we'll run right down the row, okay? Um, 30 seconds. What's the one thing you want to leave the audience with? Get involved if you aren't already and contribute. Um, learn more about what's going on with clinical trials. And when you make choices, make sure that the choices that you make are efficacious, that the money that you're donating really goes to clinical cancer research, if that's what you're interested in. I would only echo that and uh, get your napkin and your felt tip paper, uh, pen and, and do some calculations if, uh, uh, if you're interested in uh, contributing or supporting research. Uh, Look for things that have a higher probability, uh, if you can, and uh, the leverage that, that, uh, that your philanthropy can support, if, if that's where you're going to approach this from. As a scientist, um, I would hope that uh, you would look for opportunities of things that aren't being done, uh, and look for ways of seeking answers and pursuing your theories uh, with uh, sealing wax and shoestring, uh, as they did at the Cavendish Laboratory. And I've got to at least, uh, you can keep that. Um, I've got to get my two cents in on this one, okay? I want it on record. To the members of the Arizona State Legislature, um, it would be really wonderful if you figured out a way to find some money to fund clinical trials here in Arizona that we can get on the docket for next year. Okay, now it's your and, and I would certainly second that. And the only other aspect that I think I'd like to add is that this kind of organization and Mark's talk emphasize the, the absolute need for c collaboration from basic scientists to translational scientists to, to clinical researchers and patients. And so we need to be building those bridges. And, and, and I think with that, we'll increase our advocacy successes, but we'll also increase our scientific and clinical successes. I'd like to thank our panelists. You guys were all awesome with a difficult question that nobody's been able to figure out the answer to, which is how do we fund life-saving, life-changing innovation? And we're all looking at different ways to do that. And thank you so much for sharing with us today.
Thank you.